Our scripture reading today comes from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, verses 23 through 25. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demonics, epileptics, paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee to the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. St. Michael's had always been a wealthy church. Its 400 members usually gave a combined annual offering of over $2 million because they could afford to do so. We should invite them here. <laughs> over the years, however, the neighborhood around the beautiful church had begun, had begun to change. Immigrants flocked to the area, changing the complexion of the community. Steel bars would place welcome signs in the store windows. Homeless people could be found wandering the streets. The changes had made some members of St. Michael's very uncomfortable, and so they usually tried to avoid that part of town, except on Sundays. Now one Sunday, this was shortly after a new priest had joined the staff, the church members were gathered after the morning service in the flower garden for coffee and pastries. As the elegantly dressed worshippers sipped their coffee and chatted in the garden, a homeless man shuffled in off the street. He entered through the garden gate and he looked at no one. He quietly walked over to the table where a spread of ex expensive pastries was displayed on doiled silver trays. He picked up one of the pastries and bit into it, keeping his eyes closed. Then he reached for a second pastry and he placed it into his pocket. And moving slowly and trying not to be noticed, he placed another pastry into his pocket. The garden buzzed with whispers and finally one of the women walked over to the new priest and said, Do something. Still feeling a little awkward in his new position, I know how he feels. The priest handed his coffee cup to the woman. He walked over to the table and he stood next to the homeless man. Then he picked up one of the silver trays loaded with pastries and he emptied it into a box. He did the same with the second tray. Then he closed the lids on the boxes and held them out for the homeless man to take. And then he said to him, we're here every Sunday. The man smiled, he cradled the boxes in his arms, and he shuffled quietly out of the garden and scurried off down the street. The priest returned to his coffee cup, smiled at the woman holding it, and said, that is what you meant when you said do something, isn't it? <laughs> As Christians, all eyes are on us, and what we say and do can make all the difference. This morning in Matthew's scripture, we, we become familiar with Jesus because we see that he is becoming popular and all eyes are on him as he's fulfilling God's purpose. Verse 23 says, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. This one verse is, is wonderful because it gives us insight into Christ's ministry and we can learn from what Jesus was doing. Well, the first thing he was doing was proclaiming or preaching. If I was to ask you, what does it mean to preach? I think the common answer would either be to point at me or to say pe preaching means to deliver a sermon. Well, here's what Mr. Webster says about preaching. Preaching is to urge acceptance of an idea or course of action. It is to set forth in a sermon, to advocate earnestly, to deliver publicly. Jesus came earnestly to inform people about God, about God's love, about God's forgiveness, about God's desire to be part of their lives. Jesus preached about the law. 
He felt the law was important and should be followed, but he advocated that the law should never be placed above human need or suffering. Jesus preached the truth about God. He took the guesswork out of faith and let everyone know exactly what following God was all about. Jesus preached with a passion that demonstrated a loving, living law. Jesus provided a personal connection to God and showed people what God was really like because Jesus was a preacher. Second, Jesus was a teacher, which means he came to guide, to impart knowledge, to instruct by example, to conduct instruction on a regular basis. The problem with teaching is that sometimes the one learning can misinterpret the meaning. Sometimes we jump to the wrong conclusions. In Britain, they call this the wrong end of the stick. Sometimes half-truths can become the standard of living. When Jesus taught, he was able to clear up any misunderstandings and convey the true meaning of God. He brought clarity to a confused world by teaching with honesty and truth. Jesus was a teacher. Finally, Jesus was a healer. I have a great book in my office. My dad was great at reference books. He had a reference book for anything and everything that ever existed. We have it too, it's called the internet. But he did it all, he did it all in books. And so I have inherited some and picked up some of that. And I've got a wonderful book in my office by Andrew Hill called The Bible Lists. And it's lists and categories of all things that happen in the Bible. And one of the things in this book Andrew Hill lists the miracles of Jesus. There are 36. And of the 36 miracles, 23 are classified as healing miracles. Almost two-thirds of Jesus' miracles involved healing. When Jesus healed, it accomplished two things. First, it addressed people's pain and suffering. Jesus healed blindness and deafness and leprosy. He healed people who couldn't walk, who couldn't talk who couldn't stand up straight, who had withered hands. He healed people's children. He healed a boy with epilepsy, a woman with blood disorders, a man with dropsy, and on more than one occasion, he brought people back to life. When Jesus performed these miracles, he relieved individuals of their pain, their worry, their misconceptions, and by making them all better, he gave them back their dignity and their sense of purpose. The other element to healing is that it showed that Jesus was a man of action. He did more than simply tell people or teach people about God's truth. He lived out that word every day. Jesus performed 36 miracles. He told 39 parables. And in a time when people lived in a world where men were dominant and women were not given equality, 25 women were pivotal to Jesus' ministry. This tells me that Jesus turned words into deeds, thoughts into actions, and theories he put into practice. So let's do a quick recap. recap. Jesus in his ministry came to explain what God was all about and how we can have that right relationship with God. He preached to earnestly tell people about God. He taught to convey the true meaning of God. He healed to relieve suffering and put words into actions. So how do we, very dry, how do we fit into that formula? Does God expect us to preach and teach and heal? Yes. In following Christ's example, we need to be able to preach, to teach, and to heal. Oh my. Well, let's not panic, but let's look at what we are supposed to do. First, there is preaching. Now, don't panic. I'm not going to send around a sign-up sheet, I promise. <laughs> Christ was able to proclaim, or I like the way the dictionary puts it, advocate earnestly for God. And so can we. When we proclaim or preach, it means that we need to say with certainty what we believe. As Christians, we live differently from our fellow citizens. We talk to God. We read our Bibles. We forgive others and try not to hold grudges. We do acts of kindness for total strangers. 
We remember Christ in the bread and the cup. We turn the other cheek. We go to church. We give a portion of what we earn to the Lord's work. When we do these things, we are declaring a life lived for God. We are proclaiming to the world that the living Christ comes first in our lives. We are preaching the gospel for all to see. And next, we are supposed to teach. Now, how does the average person do that? Shouldn't those that teach, especially if you're going to teach the Bible and God's Word, shouldn't they be scholars and professors and students of theology? Shouldn't they be reverends and doctors and reverend doctors and, and everything else that we call them? In its simplest form, teaching about God is being able to explain our faith. And the best way to do that is by example. We teach when we love and forgive and help and serve. We teach when we put Jesus first, others second, and ourselves last. We teach when we pray, when we listen, when we offer compassion. Every time we live out our faith, every time we do something for God's glory, every time we do not the easy thing, but the right thing, we teach. And finally, as Christians, we heal. Now, I'm not suggesting that we all go to medical school, but I am suggesting that as Christians, we heal. And we do that when we learn from Jesus that when he healed, he put his words into action. As Christians, we don't sit and do nothing. We roll up our sleeves and we get involved. We heal when we write a check to the church. We heal when we support our local organizations, when we give of our time to serving God, when we go on a mission trip, when we host a mission trip. We heal. We heal when we offer someone a hand, when we give them a listening ear, when we encourage them to use us as a shoulder to cry on. Every time we physically go out and do God's work, and do things in God's name, we are healing. And when we heal, when we help people, whether we know them or not, we restore their dignity and their sense of purpose. Now, it, it, it feels to me that it's time for a story. So I'm, I'm just going to launch into one, and, and we'll, we'll hope that's okay. This is a story about an everyday man who, who with his wife, took on this purpose of, of preaching and teaching and healing the way that I think we should do as servants of Christ. So this is an ordinary man. He wasn't rich. He wasn't prestigious. He wasn't born into the pillar of society. He was an everyday person, born into an everyday family, living an everyday life. He was a good boy. He never gave his parents any trouble. He didn't stay out late, he didn't refuse to obey, he did what he was told, and he learned to be a good citizen in his community. This was a boy who was born first in the family, so he was obligated and very willingly filled the duty as first son, helped out around the house, helped and went into the family business, and when his father died, took over that business to help to provide for the family. A good boy, a good man, who, who worshipped with his family and who lived a very ordinary life. Until one day, he decided to do something drastically different. He decided that it was time for him to really live for God. So he quit the family business and he decided that he would make it his life's mission to go out and tell people about God. And so that's what he did. And so he went, I guess today we'd say he went on the lecture circuit. So he went all over the world. And he told people, and he proclaimed to people, and he taught people, and he showed by example what God was all about. And he became very popular. And people liked him. And there's always been these theologians throughout history you get Paul and Peter in the Bible, you get Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr., Billy Graham, people who devote their whole lives to God. 
And this man was no different. And the more popular he became, the more brazen and bold he became in his teaching. And for the first time in his life, all of a sudden, he's having trouble with the law and the authorities. <coughs> He's doing things that are not seen as a good man, but seem to go against what you're supposed to do in society. But he kept with it. And it didn't matter how popular or famous or infamous, since he was in trouble with those in charge, it didn't matter how popular he became. The greatest thing about what this man was trying to do is he never stopped taking time for God each day. Each day he found time while he was teaching and preaching and healing, each day he found time to talk with God, to meditate with God, and to give God the attention that God deserves. And even when this man's life came to an end, as all of our lives do, and even when he had five minutes left, left to live, he never stopped in his zeal for God. Even when he was on a cross on a tree with a criminal on the right and a criminal on the left, he still in those final moments preached and teached and healed. And we are called to do the same with our lives. When we teach, we say with certainty what Christ is about. That's preaching. When we preach, we say with certainty what Christ is about. With, when we teach, we explain with our actions with our example, what our faith is all about. And when we heal, we roll up our sleeves and get to work doing God's work and giving people back their dignity and sense of purpose. Christ did it all those years ago as an ordinary person here on earth. And with his help, we can do the same each and every day. Let us pray. Dear God, help us to preach your word, to teach about Christ, to put our words into action, now and always. Amen.